About 12 years ago, I moved to New York City with the hope that I would become a photographer. And what I realized was that I did not want to do photography. Photography, to me, uh, became a way of enforcing power, a way of capturing something, and a way of exerting control over other people. So a few years later, I started down a different path. And I began exploring ways to defeat photography. Um, when you're looking at this slide here, you see a computer vision algorithm analyzing an image, looking for faces. And in 2010, I developed this proof of concept project thinking about a future in a more machine readable world where our faces are being analyzed more often. And computer vision now exerts control over those images captured through photography. And to me, photography, which is done with a camera, became inseparable to surveillance cameras. So my interest shifted away from thinking about how to capture the world into an experiment like this, where I'm thinking about how to disappear into the world. And what you see happening here is on the left, the face is detected. And you can see that by the number of confidence scores overlapping it. Each green box represents one possible face. And on the right, you see not many confidence boxes. Um, as this very slowed down version of face detection plays through, what you see is that on the right, there is no face detected. And this project comes out of kind of reverse engineering the way that a face detection algorithm works and then undermining it exploiting that vulnerability through something low cost uh, that could be simple, such as hair, makeup, or fashion styling. So now let's look through the algorithm and see what the face detection algorithm is looking at. Here we can see a heat map overlay showing on the left a very, very face-like image, and on the right a non-face-like image. An important concept to realize with computer vision is that there's no such thing as an absolute face. You only have more face-like and less face-like. And what you see here is how that plays out through the algorithm's reading of an image. And that's an important concept to understand if you're interested in creating ways of disappearing or types of computer vision camouflage. That camouflage, in this case, is about understanding the threshold of detection at what point a face becomes not a face, and then figuring out how to appear just one step below that. I took this way of thinking to another kind of imaging in 2013, here looking at thermal imaging. Thermal imaging looks at the heat radiated by a body, which emits about 100 watts. It's a very effective way to look at someone over a long distance, and especially from a drone, a military drone. And the idea with this project is to explore, is there a way to disappear, to exist under that threshold of detection of military observation? And the solution, an experiment, and a provocation is called stealthware. And it looks at using silver-plated fabrics to shield the thermal energy emitted from a body. And here you see the title of this one is called the anti-drone burqa deliberately provocative, but the idea here is to reimagine a religious garment in the age of, of mass surveillance and military surveillance and think about it instead of providing a separation between man and God, providing a separation between man and drone. And there's also a hijab that's part of that collection. Now you can look at this image from thermal test footage, which shows a uh, few people standing around a van, and one of the people is wearing the anti-drone burqa. If you look in the center, you can see a slight difference in the tonality. And now when I play it, you'll see the motion, and it'll be very clear. And the legs were deliberately left not concealed. But of course, now that you have the idea and the technology that thermal imaging can be blocked, you have the solution. After that project, I began thinking, what's happening next, and what's the big picture? 
where are we headed in terms of a machine-readable world with computer vision analyzing more of our appearances on social media, but also more in the physical world. And I began looking at what does it mean to be captured as a pixel? How much data can you represent in a pixel? And so to understand what it means to be captured and represented as a pixel, I want to talk about how much data can be represented in something that normally we would think of as very boring. One pixel is not impressive compared to the capabilities of your 8-megapixel me camera phone. But one pixel contains 256 different values in grayscale. Uh, if we were to look at that um, and try to understand the difference between two colors that to a computer vision algorithm are completely different, uh, we can't interpret those. So this space of 256 variables, not all of them are legible to a person while they are to a computer until we put text on it showing each different color. Now we can do an experiment with just one pixel of information. We can encode nearly every letter in the Times and Roman font set with about 97% uniqueness. And we find out that the most unique character is M, meaning it has the highest amount of separation from all the other characters. You're probably thinking this is not that interesting. Except a lot of people post text that's been pixelated online. Maybe you have, I find it and I use it for my own research, looking at how dangerous is it to post pixelated text, because that's not a redaction, it's a reduction in information. And in this experiment, you can see up on the left-hand side the pixelated text, which is only 12 pixels. When you run that against a genetic algorithm, you discover that those 12 pixels said Ernest. Now, if we go up to 2x2 two two pixels, it's still not very impressive. But if you were to look at every combination of 2x2 two two pixels, so here we have um, about 4.3 million combinations, which would take you about 136 years to look at every single combination that you can represent at 2x2. Two two. I can speed up that animation, and it would only take 13 years to look at every combination of it. Now, if we go up to 4x4, four four, the amount of, of variables that can be represented in this space increases exponentially. And we're already at a point that exceeds the capacity of the entire human race's perceptual capabilities. Meaning if you tasked every person on the planet with looking at that image for their entire life, we would never succeed in looking at every combination. Which is to say, that's a lot of information. Now if we go to 8x8, eight eight, that's even more information. And you can represent quite a lot of different things at a very low resolution. If we go to color, we have to the third more possibilities. So often in computer vision, that's actually too much information, and you've reduced that back to grayscale because you have so many representations just in grayscale at 8x8. Eight eight. What can we do? With 6x7 pixels, we can do face recognition on a, on a sample size of about 50 people with 95% accuracy. We can build a visual search engine, reducing uh, every image to about 8x8 eight eight pixels. This is called a perceptual hash. And that's how you search for copyright infringement. When we go to 14x14, 14 14, we only have about an 18% reduction in performance in a facial recognition system compared to the original face. When we go up to 12 by 16, we can begin to encode and detect human activity, which brings up the question, if you are building a system to detect motion, to look at whether people are standing or walking or riding a bike, if you can do that at 12 by 16, do you really need to store uh, HD footage at 1920 by 1080? 
And at 24 by 24, we have the definition of the, the boundaries and the parameters of the human face. When we go up to 40 by 40, this is all the amount of information needed to do facial analysis. Many smartphone apps that will show you things like age estimation, emotion, it will find your face in an image, 40 pixels. And as we increase that space up to 100, 100 by 100 pixels, 10,000 pixels in total, this is everything that you need to do face recognition at scale, meaning government agencies, law enforcement agencies. When they look at you, it's in 100 pixel space. Now, of course, we go to color, and this is more similar to where we're capturing images and posting them. If we take that 100 by 100 pixel image and compare it to the amount of information posted on Instagram, that's only 2.5% of one photo. A very small of information leads to a very large amount of information. And some of it can be quite uncomfortable. Here's a research study that came out last year looking at inferring criminality, basically an updated version of phrenology, but with AI. So here, in this example, it's looking at the lip curvature, and it's basing the way that you look uh, against the database of criminals. And if you look like a criminal, you have a higher criminal score. Not fair, is it? Now here's another one that's looking at psychological attributes. And again, it's an inference. If you look like someone who's intelligent, if you look like someone who's kind, chances are you may also be kind, according to this algorithm. And some of the labels they have are literally weird. One of the labels is weird, intelligent, kind. So being able to infer this information from a 100 by 100 pixel space remotely, meaning I could capture one image and do that to every single person in the room right now. Other things that you could do, predict decision-making capabilities with about a 20% higher accuracy than people. And here's a company that eventually sold their product to Google in 2014 called Jetpack. And what's really interesting here is what they're doing is analyzing images on Instagram. And you can see the guy with the mustache, but you probably can't guess why that's valuable. Well, they use that image to detect where there might be a hipster cafe. And then they build a visual guidebook. So if you're visiting that city, you could go to the hipster cafe. But the image on the bottom is even better. This one is looking at girls wearing lipstick and the location of the photo posted to tell guys where to find bars with single women. Um, now, this one, I think, is great. Looking at, with computer vision, whether someone is going to be a high-performing CEO based on the width of their mouth. But it's okay if you don't have a wide mouth, as long as you're interested in running an NGO. Because the opposite is true for nonprofit agencies. A narrower mouth is good. These are just a few of many research papers that have come out in the last few years that are mining attributes, inferring attributes, from images appearing mostly on social media. And here's a glance at what some of those data sets look like. One of them is quite unbelievable, which is Facebook does not have only 4,000 images. But in the publicly available ones, the number is always going up. And the one in particular uh, that the research paper is from, Microsoft recently published a data set of about 10 million photos with 100,000 identities. Where do these people come from? Celebrities, photos posted online. That's what's being used to train algorithms. That's what's being used to train new products for emotion recognition. And that's also what's being used to train government surveillance programs. Here's a slide from 2014. 
And this one, if you look at the pictures on the bottom, they're babies. These are images being used to hone government surveillance programs. Unfortunately, for people in Lithuania, uh, it does include you. As a U.S. citizen, for some reason, I'm excluded from this search. Uncomfortable things happening. Where do these images come from? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, of course, Flickr. So this is what happens when photos are posted online. This is who's looking at them. And when you have enough photos, you can create more photos. You can create resolution through those photos. What's happening now is a, a field of study called generative adversarial networks and super resolution, where instead of taking a 100 by 100 pixel image, you take an 11 by 11 pixel image, and then you synthesize the larger image. So starting with 11 by 11, you can generate a 3D profile of someone. Then you can change the lighting and the pose, and then you can build a more robust facial recognition profile from 11 by 11 pixels. Is this still photography at this point? No. This is a visual database. And these are visual databases that hold the unique story of your biometrics, your friend's biometrics, your kids' biometrics, your location, your emotion, and your movements. Many of your life's moments can be recorded and reduced into a very small pixel space. But I think that if we look critically at this pixel space as images, as a visual database, and if we look deeper into these pixels, we can begin to understand how we're appearing to them. And we can also begin to imagine new technologies for enhancing privacy and information security. And possibly also imagine new ways of appearing into the world and disappearing into the world. Thank you.